Welcome to Historical Spotlight. In part one of the American system, we examined the economic principles espoused by Alexander Hamilton, the ideological founder of the American system. Today in part two, we will look at opposition by several founding fathers to the economic system of Alexander Hamilton. In part three, we will examine the implementation of the American system by Henry Clay and the Whig Party in the years preceding the Civil War. On September 2, 1789, the first Congress of the United States was in session at Federal Hall in New York City. The discussion inside concerned the economic future of the young country. At the time, the nation's finances were in a precarious position. Due to the Revolutionary War, the nation had gone into significant debt and several domestic industries had been damaged. By the end of the day, Congress had decided to establish the Department of Treasury for the management of the government's finances. Shortly thereafter, President George Washington appointed Alexander Hamilton the first Secretary of the Treasury. Desiring economic independence for the United States, President Washington and Congress asked Secretary Hamilton for a plan to achieve this end. In order to accomplish this, Hamilton formulated an economic plan that consisted of three basic planks. First, bounties or subsidies to private business. Second, protective tariffs and third, the establishment of a national bank. About 25 years later, Hamilton's economic plan would form the foundation of Henry Clay's American system. While Congress never formally adopted Hamilton's plan, it did pass legislation on tariffs and a national bank. There was, however, considerable opposition to the plan amongst several of the nation's prominent founders and leaders. Let's take a look at the opposition to Alexander Hamilton's plan. First, concerning bounties or subsidies to private business. Initially, the question as to whether bounties were constitutional was raised. Hamilton's response was that bounties were indeed constitutional. He argued that under Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, Congress had the express authority to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts, and provide for the common defense and general welfare. Therefore, it was of necessity left to the discretion of the National Legislature to pronounce upon the objects which concern the general welfare, and for which, under that description, an appropriation of money is requisite and proper. Hamilton's interpretation meant that taxes collected by the government could be used by Congress to aid any industry it thought beneficial to the general welfare. So if Congress deemed that the success of the codfishing industry benefited the general welfare of the country, it was then constitutional to grant it a monetary subsidy from the federal treasury. Hamilton, however, never explained how helping a specific industry would increase the general welfare of the entire population, nor did he give criteria for distinguishing which specific industries would benefit the general welfare. Initially, James Madison took offense with Hamilton's interpretation of the welfare clause. In January 1792, less than a month after the report was issued, Madison wrote, What do you think of the commentary on the terms general welfare? The federal government has been hitherto limited to the specified powers by the greatest champions for latitude in expounding those powers. If not only the means but the objects are unlimited, the parchment had better be thrown into the fire at once. Madison went on, If Congress can do whatever in their discretion can be done by money, and will promote the general welfare, the government is no longer a limited one possessing enumerated powers, but an indefinite one, subject to particular exceptions. In Madison's opinion, the federal government is limited by enumerated powers. Therefore, the use of the general welfare clause by Congress as a reason to grant subsidies, which were not enumerated, was not justified. Thomas Jefferson also questioned the constitutionality of federal bounties or subsidies. In a February 1792 memo prepared for himself called Notes on the Constitutionality of Bounties to Encourage Manufacturing, he wrote, Bounties have, in some instances, been a successful instrument for the introduction of new and useful manufactures, but the use of them has been found almost inseparable from abuse. 
The power of dispensing them has not been delegated by the Constitution to the general government. It remains with the state governments, whose local information renders them competent judges of the particular arts and manufactures for which circumstances have matured them. Along with Madison's objection to subsidies on constitutional grounds, Jefferson raised another objection. Jefferson reasoned that only individual states could have adequate knowledge of its own industries. Therefore, whether or not an industry needed a subsidy should remain a local matter. If not, then abuse was possible. What was that possible abuse? Economic favoritism. Hamilton recognized that possible abuse would be a charge against subsidies. In the report, he wrote, There is a degree of prejudice against bounties, from an appearance of giving away the public money without all immediate consideration, and from a supposition that they serve to enrich particular classes at the expense of the community. He went on, But it is the interest of the society, in each case, to submit to the temporary expense, which is more than compensated by all increase of industry and wealth, by an augmentation of resources and independence, and by the circumstance of eventual cheapness, which has been noticed in another place. Hamilton dismissed this argument on the basis that bounties would eventually create wealth for all, increase independence, and create cheaper goods. He never explained, however, how this would happen. While Congress did not formally accept Hamilton's plan, an important debate over bounties did take place. In February 1792, Congress debated whether to give aid to the cod fishing industry. During the debate, Congressman Hugh Williamson of North Carolina expressed some of Jefferson's fears about subsidies. He stated, Perhaps the case I have put is too strong. Congress can never do a thing that is so palpably unjust. But this, sir, is the very mark at which the theory of bounty seems to point. The certain operation of that measure is the oppression of the southern states by superior numbers in the northern interests. This was to be feared at the formation of this government, and you find many articles in the Constitution besides those I have quoted, which were certainly intended to guard us against the dangerous bias of interest in the power of numbers. Williamson was clear on subsidies. If they were allowed, one section of the nation or particular industry could be shown favoritism over others. In his opinion, this was unjust. The House of Representatives eventually passed bounties to the cod fishermen. This is the breakdown of votes. It seems that the votes were skewed toward one section of the country. The country would remain divided over the concept of government subsidies until 1865. Let's take a look at the opposition raised against Alexander Hamilton's position on tariffs. The U.S. Constitution is clear on tariffs. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 states that Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. There was generally no dispute that tariffs were constitutional. In fact, along with land sales, most legislators saw tariffs as the principal method of raising revenue for the federal government. In 1792, approximately 95% of the federal revenue came from tariffs. However, there was a dispute as to whether tariffs should selectively protect domestic industries from foreign competition or exist solely as a revenue-producing means. Hamilton, in his report, advocated for protective tariffs. He proposed 5-10% to 10 increases on 20 different products. Following Hamilton's report, Congress enacted the Tariff Bill of 1792. It seems some in Congress may have been persuaded by Hamilton. Tariff rates were raised close to those proposed by Hamilton. Tariff historian Frank Towsing notes, for a short time after 1789, it may be possible to detect a drift in favor of protective duties, which doubtless was strengthened by the powerful advocacy of protection in Hamilton's report on manufactures. Others at the time may also have been aware of this drift toward protective tariffs. John Page, congressman and later governor of Virginia, said, It is not a bill for the protection of the frontiers, but for the encouragement of certain manufacturers. It is a bill very different from what it ought to be. 
John Mercer, congressman and later governor of Maryland, stated, Independent of the constitutional question of the right of Congress, why should we be compelled to consider the extensive range and delicate refinement of encouraging manufacturers by extensive duties operating as indirect bounties under the pressure providing for an Indian war? Both congressmen suspected that the tariff bill was not intended to raise revenue for defense, but as a means for encouraging manufacturing. Here's the final vote on the bill. Notice the vote totals. Again, the result seems to be skewed by region. The vote will be a harbinger of the sectional differences and bitter confrontations over tariffs that would arise in the coming years. The third plank in Hamilton's American system, the National Bank, also raised quite a debate. Following Hamilton's report to Congress on the necessity of a national bank, the House of Representatives passed the bank bill on February 8, 1791. The result was 39 for and 20 against. However, again, the vote totals appear to be along regional lines. 19 out of the 20 nays were from congressmen representing Maryland and states from the South. Still, in order for the bill to become law, the president had to sign it. President Washington, however, seemed to be unsure of the bill's constitutionality and was hesitant to sign it. He asked his cabinet to advise him. Attorney General Edmund Randolph from Virginia felt that the bill was unconstitutional. Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson also argued that the bank's relevance to constitutionally authorized powers was weak. He wrote, The incorporation of a bank and the powers assumed by this bill have not, in my opinion, been delegated to the United States by the Constitution. In Jefferson's opinion, the incorporation of a national bank was not an enumerated power. Therefore, it was not constitutional. For similar reasons, future president and architect of the Constitution, James Madison, also thought the bill unconstitutional. Alexander Hamilton quickly responded to the opposition's arguments. First, he pointed out that Congress has the constitutional power to tax and borrow funds. Second, Hamilton referred to the Necessary and Proper Clause found in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 of the U.S. Constitution. This states, The Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. He argued that this clause allowed Congress to use reasonable means for carrying out the powers of taxing and borrowing. Third, he said a national bank was a necessary and proper means for carrying out these powers. He followed this with the theory that since the Constitution cannot enumerate every means, some powers are necessarily implied by the Constitution. Thus, even though the bank is not an enumerated power, it is an implied power and therefore constitutional. The decision ultimately fell to President George Washington. Washington sided with Hamilton and signed the bill into law on February 25, 1791. The bank was in operation until its charter expired in 1811. Its constitutionality would formally be challenged in the 1819 landmark Supreme Court case of McCulloch v. Maryland. As we have seen, not everyone was enamored with Hamilton's American system. Thomas Jefferson was particularly critical. In a September 9, 1792 letter to President Washington, Jefferson wrote, I have utterly disapproved of the system of the Secretary of Treasury. His system flowed from principles averse to liberty and was calculated to undermine and demolish the Republic by creating an influence of his department over the members of the legislature. Nonetheless, with the exception of subsidies, tariffs and the National Bank were the policy of the United States until the War of 1812. Following the war, another champion for the American system would arise. His name was Henry Clay. Clay would advocate for the American system with a fervor not seen since the days of Hamilton. The political divisions caused by the plan in 1791 would seem small compared to the divisions it would cause in the years up to 1860. Thanks for watching Historical Spotlight. You can watch more historical videos at www.historicalspotlight.com. Thank you.